Hey hey, Marcus House with you here. Today we are again launching a Falcon Heavy, uh, really in preparation for the Falcon Heavy launch which is due to be launched still prior to the end of 2018, currently scheduled so spaceflightnow.com is telling us around November 30, obviously this is subject to change, but the general details of that mission are that SpaceX's Falcon Heavy rocket is going to launch a US Air Force Space Test Program 2 mission with a cluster of military and scientific research satellites. It's going to be super exciting. And for those of you that don't know a huge amount about the Falcon Heavy, it's essentially three Falcon 9 rocket cores strapped together with 27 Merlin 1D engines firing at liftoff. Now the payload that we are sending up here today is essentially destined for the moon. What I'm trying to do is see if we can place a refueling vessel on the moon's surface and uh, we can then use that for a future mission which will be kind of a part two to this video. Now this is all simulated using Kerbal Space Program with all of the Realism Overhaul and Real Solar System mod pack installed, actually running this still on version 1.2.2 which is actually a lower version than what uh, is supported by most of the Realism Overhaul mods now. Just coming up to the side engine booster cutoff, leaving enough fuel to come back and land. And there we go there, just decoupling those. Those are going to both come down and land on two separate drone ships, so stay tuned for that here shortly. We first need to do just a slight correction burn to make sure that they're going to come down over the top of the two drone ships. I have actually left just a slight fuel margin in these just because we had a little to spare. They are burning slightly in the wrong direction compared to what you would expect them to be. That's simply because the drone ship placement was just a little bit off where I was needing it to be. But uh, only a very, very low thrust burn here just to correct for that. So there we go, those two boosters are going to coast until they need to do their re-entry burn. Meanwhile, of course, we have our main core stage firing up here, getting well up above 3,000 meters per second compared to our surface speed. And up in the top right here, we have uh, got our footage of the boosters just coasting their way to that actual entry burn. Today we are actually expending this core booster simply because we don't actually need it anymore and we've also exited the atmosphere pretty much at the same time so we've ditched the fairings at the exact same time. So you can see now our payload here, uh, we'll talk a lot more about that as the launch profile progresses. For the moment we're going to watch those two side boosters re-enter and come back down to land on two separate drone ships. We need to first pull out those grid fins, start our re-entry burn. We're going to bring our surface speed down to around 1100 meters per second. That's going to uh, make sure that we don't burn up too badly in the atmosphere. As it is, this is a reasonably fast re-entry speed. You'll notice that as we hit around 20,000 meters in altitude, we really start to bleed off speed. And in doing so, we really start to rip through that atmosphere, generating quite a lot of heat. The grid fins, of course, actually controlling our trajectory so that we bleed off most of our horizontal velocity, coming straight down over the drone ship's three engine burn, then switching to a single engine burn just to come and touch down, hopefully successfully. And you can see them both there, two drone ships, two cores and touchdown on both. Now obviously I've done this a bunch of times but each time I need to completely reconfigure the entry velocities, the entry angles, all sorts of variables that need to go into actually achieving a landing like that. So there we go, both of our Falcon Heavy cores there for full recovery, switching back to our footage of stage two and jumping back in time slightly. We can see that the stage two here is just coming up to around 4,700 meters per second in terms of its orbital velocity. Now, the acceleration of the stage two is actually quite slow. The single Merlin vacuum engine here is actually pushing a very high mass payload, especially for the Falcon Heavy. This is almost 49 ton in terms of its actual payload mass. Very, very large. The Falcon Heavy in general has the ability to lift into orbit almost 64 metric tons, but that includes expending both of the side boosters as well, so actually not recovering any of the vessel. To actually recover all three boosters, the payload mass needs to be much less again. So this is somewhere in between the maximum capability. That's why we've expended that 
uh, central core. Now, uh, I hear some of you saying already, why did you leave the grid fins and the landing legs on the central core? Uh, this is a very good point, actually. And I swear that I had them removed when I was filming the footage, but for whatever reason, I must have forgotten to take them off or loaded slightly the wrong version of the vessel. So yes, that was a little bit of a mistake, which I've only just picked up in editing. I, I swear that I had them removed. But anyway, let's talk a little about the actual vessel that we are sending to the moon today. So this is a vessel that is largely made up of fuel mass. We need the fuel mass to give us the Delta V to land on the moon, but we need a very large fuel tank here to use as our refueling station. The upper stage of this vessel would not be uh, necessarily made by SpaceX, it might be a payload made by another space agency. It's essentially powered with liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen, and it's using the wonderful RL-10 engine, or a variant of the RL-10 engine that isn't actually in production, but they've run some very, very good tests on this variant of the RL-10, and we'll talk about that a little later as well. Now, what we're going to be doing is utilizing the ISRU mods, uh, which stands for in situ resource utilization for those of you that don't know that's essentially going to allow us to refuel the vessel using water ice uh, we're going to convert the water ice to liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen and we're going to be doing that with a bunch of parts here that come with the real isru mod now just uh, a little disclaimer here what i've had to do to make this work is kind of modify the configs because the configuration for all of this doesn't really allow fast enough refueling to make this sort of thing viable. Now our stage two here is just passing 7,350 meters per second. Obviously orbital velocity is right up near 8,000 meters per second, just shy of 8,000 meters per second. And we will have just a little fuel remaining in our second stage at engine cutoff. And there we go, we've just hit orbital velocity, engine off, and there we go, a perfect orbit. We are going to be heading up towards an apoapsis of around 260 kilometers. Uh, before that though, we're going to set up our translunar injection burn. We need to make quite a large burn, around 3,000 meters per second uh, is going to be needed to get from a low Earth orbit up to intercept with the moon. So we'll select our moon here and now setting up a maneuver node to give us a good idea how much delta V is going to be needed to intercept with the moon's sphere of influence. As soon as we're in the sphere of influence, of course, we can come right down to a low periapsis around the moon. So if we fast forward time and watch our vessel orbit very, very quickly around the Earth's surface, and we're going to bring it to around six minutes prior to our maneuver node time, that's going to mean that we can burn away the last bit of fuel here in our stage two. There we go there, we can decouple that and fire our one single RL-10 engine. Now the reason we are burning so far before our maneuver node is because this is a very, very small engine for the payload mass that it needs to push all the way up to land on the moon. So we're actually going to need to do multiple burns and multiple passes to raise our apoapsis enough to meet up with the moon. Now in that first pass, we only really wiped off around 1100 meters per second there, but because our payload mass is now lighter, obviously we've already burned a lot of fuel, we'll be able to do the rest of our burn in the one pass. Again, a very long burn, possibly not the most efficient, but we do have the Delta V needed to come right up and land on the moon within these two passes. Now the wonderful thing about this engine is we can actually lower our thrust right down to make this burn super accurate. We don't even need to do a correction burn. We can just deploy those solar panels and start time warping until we get up to the moon's sphere of influence. And as we watch the Earth there fall away slowly behind us, we can really appreciate just how much effort goes in to the mods here for the Realism Overhaul Real Solar System Pack. The uh, mod developers really have done an absolutely brilliant job putting this together. I mean, look at the textures and the realism of the way the moon there looks. Just absolutely unbelievable. Our refuel vessel here now needs to do a retrograde burn to make sure that it can fall down into a low moon orbit. Now, just a few other small disclaimers around some of the things that I had to modify to get this refuel vessel to work. The boil off of the liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen is so fast that it's impossible to actually accumulate more because it's leaking out faster. Now that is something that can be sold with uh, currently evolving technology that will allow 
much better cryogenic storage of that fuel. And of course we know that this must work otherwise proposals such as the BFR just wouldn't be possible if we couldn't store liquid fuels for a long period of time then landing on Mars after carrying the fuel uh, would obviously not be possible. So I do urge the uh, the mod developers that are creating the real ISRU mods to just uh, probably re-evaluate how fast boil offs are happening and all that sort of thing or maybe I'm misunderstanding something or don't have a tank setting set correctly but nevertheless I did have a lot of trouble with that and needed to modify the configs to make it a little bit more realistic. So we've just started off another burn here another retrograde burn just to lower our periapsis right down so that we're going to come over a previously used landing site that already has two supply vessels down here. So we're going to put all of these together. Now if you would like to check out those two missions I do have videos on where we launched both of those to the moon surface. You can check out the first here. Uh, the first was actually a smaller vessel that uh, used all three core recoveries and the next one was actually uh, partly expendable kind of like this mission is so you can check that one out here as well. Now I did say that I would talk a little more about this particular variation of the RL10 engine. Essentially this engine that I have got installed here is the CECE -E engine, the common extensible cryogenic engine. And although this engine hasn't been used in real life, it has been tested successfully in real life and it's essentially a test bed to develop RL10 engines that throttle super low. So low in fact that in 2009 NASA reported successfully throttling this engine from 104% thrust to only 8% thrust. This essentially will allow a very small vessel like this to essentially hover over the moon's surface and do a hover landing without needing to do any sort of suicide burn. And you can see that I have demonstrated this quite well here. I'm coming down quite slowly. I've got the, uh, the engine throttled right down and we can now just slowly bleed off speed and slowly adjust our positioning to get quite close to our two other supply vessels. And you see there, I'm not actually going to start throttling this right up until just before touchdown. So just hovering and there we go, throttling right up just as we come down to the moon surface and then throttling right back down and back up again just to demonstrate that really nicely. So there we go. We have our refueling vessel sitting quite happily here, very close by with only a kilometre or two between our smaller vessel, our smaller resupply vessel and our larger resupply vessel here. So loads of supplies next to our refueling station. We have quite a good base to go off. Now it does need to be said that uh, in real life we probably wouldn't be landing in this location. This just happens to be where we can find some good sources of uh, material to drill here with the uh, mods of Kerbal Space Program. In real life it's much more likely to be uh, quite close to one of the poles and I very much doubt that we would use drills in this way to actually uh, mine for water ice. Uh, I think there'd be a lot of more interesting ways. This is the only way I can simulate with Kerbal Space Program. Of course, to do it with the real ISRU mods, we need the liquefaction array, we need radiators, we need drills, we need to do all sorts of uh, conversions here to essentially convert that ice into hydrates. We then need to convert the hydrates into water. We then need to convert the water to liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. So it's all a little bit involved. We've got our uh, electrolysis unit here, which only needs to be running when there is water available. It should really shut itself off when it's not actually doing anything um, because otherwise it just sucks a heap of power for no actual reason at all. So I had to keep turning it on and off and uh, manually restarting everything after we come back out into the daylight hours because obviously the moon is revolving around the earth and we spent half of our time in pure darkness where we can't actually run all of our drills and all of our equipment. So you can see here just how fast it does refuel during daylight hours and uh, yes as we actually time warp you'll see that we spend a lot of time on the dark side of the moon which is uh, which is no good for refueling well especially when you're using solar panels to do it like I am here there's obviously other ways we could get energy here to uh, refuel we could always set up a nuclear power reactor on the moon and do it that way for the moment though we are relying only on our solar panels so it takes around uh, 114 to 160 days to refuel this entire massive tank so please subscribe to see the next video where we're actually going to be creating a reusable moon transfer vehicle to come and land on the moon, refuel at this refuel station and head back to a low earth orbit. I've uh, got a lot of that made now. 
I hope you enjoyed this video. Of course, please do take a second, hit that like button. All of your support is awesome. If you've got any questions for me or comments on uh, how we're doing these missions, please do whack them down in the comments below. In the tile in the bottom left today, we have a moon transfer vehicle from the stock Kerbal Space Program game. In the top right, my latest video, and in the bottom right, a video that YouTube has selected just for you. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you all in the next video.